Okay, so hopefully there wasn't too much issue uh, submitting the homework and stuff. I don't know. I didn't get too many emails. Uh, but at least from what I saw submitted, most of them look uh, pretty good and clean. And so that was that was great. Um, and I'm hoping that we will uh, put out solutions by like uh, some point tomorrow, by which we by which I mean we just go through and pick out uh, some cleanly submitted ones and we'll post them to Piazza or something. Uh, so that, uh, if you wanted, you, uh, have the opportunity to change your solution and get it in time for the late deadline, uh, next when, or this upcoming Wednesday. Okay. Uh, the more you correct your own stuff, the easier it is for us to grade it. So that's why we have this. All right. Um, uh, well, I think the most important thing is, is that even if you didn't get it, as long as you understand how to do it correctly that's really the, the point anyway so um okay today's a fun one i wasn't too happy with how i did last time so hopefully today will be better uh today's a fun one because it's about graphs everyone likes graphs presumably um now that's it any other questions before we start okay great slightly fewer people that's to be expected all right, what have we been doing? Uh, the first class, we, uh, as we know, we did three sad quick sort. The theme there was mostly linearity of expectation and other introductory things. The next class, we did heavy hitters, uh, where we started talking about hash functions for the first time. We also started using Markov's inequality as a tool. The third class was about hash tables, and it was really the hard part was discussing this implementation called linear probing, uh, which again is the one we use. Uh, and we had to use some fancier tools. We went from just universal hash functions to k-wise independent hash functions for general k. And we had some kind of fancier thing in place of Markov's uh, to make some things barely work out. Okay, so what's today? Today's mostly about algorithms, not, not as much emphasis on introducing probabilistic tools. So we're going to be looking at a really cool algorithm for, for the minimum cup problem. I'll introduce that in a moment. Um, and uh, we will discuss something called the Galton-Watson process, which is this. Well, we'll talk about it when we get there. All right, so um, I'm guessing uh, you guys have, have heard of the minimum cut problem before, but I, I give you, today's everything is going to be undirected, undirected graphs. So I, I give you an undirected graph, and the goal is to just disconnect it. Not any particular pair, any pair you want. Okay? So this is a connected graph. If you stare at it long enough, you'll see any node can get to any node. Okay? And uh, the goal is to remove the minimum number of edges so that some pair, at least one pair, gets disconnected. Okay? So, uh, but I'd ask you guys, and if you've taken one of my classes before and you know the answer, please don't say it out loud. It's not that impressive if you know it. All right. Here's, here then is an instance of a problem. There are, uh, I don't know, 12-ish nodes. Not, it's a pretty small graph. Well, that said. And so my question to you is, what is the size of the minimum cut in this graph? Okay, so one idea at a time. Uh, so one idea was, so for any particular vertex, let's say this one on the right, uh, you could always remove, you know, all five edges incident to that vertex. That will certainly split off that vertex. Okay, so the minimum cut is always at most uh, the minimum degree of any vertex. Good. That's actually a very useful fact. Uh, but, of course, maybe you can do better, right? Uh, I wouldn't teach you a whole class about inspecting degrees. That was no fun. So uh, now your second idea or second suggestion was something about uh, we can look at the connected components, but this graph is connected, so that's just one connected component. Do you want to look for clicks? Uh, finding clicks is MP hard, and it's like one of the hardest ones. 
you can't get any constant factor approximation. Can anyone beat what appears to be five? That clock is so weird. Have you just noticed that? <laughs> Alright, anyone beat five? You apparently have an infinite amount of time. Only every five seconds. Okay, so you're proposing an algorithm. Uh, okay, so this algorithm uh, just, I guess, randomly split them in half and then maybe do like a local swapping where if this vertex kind of has more neighbors over here, then we'll throw them over there. Yeah. Fine. Oh. So this, this is... Uh, I, I've seen this kind of algorithm used for other problems. I don't think it'll quite work for this, although I can't quite articulate why very easily. Uh, but that's an interesting idea. Anyhow, but for this particular instance, this particular silly graph, did anyone do better than five? Sometimes people get this. Have people lost interest in doing better than five? That's also fine. Uh, well, strongly connected component is uh, really referring to str uh, directed graphs, oh, okay. uh, which interpreted and for un undirected graphs are just the same. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, which two? Okay. <laughs> Good enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how did I do this? I, I made I made uh, I made one copy of a click, and then since I'm on an iPad, I copied and pasted and rotated and put it on top of each other, and then I connected just two edges between them. Okay. So this had two. Uh, maybe this goes to show you that these problems that we take for granted are non-trivial. This was a 12-node graph, so n is 12, and uh, and it's still quite tricky, right? Now imagine n being significantly larger. Okay, okay, so that was two. Okay, so the input's an undirected graph. I want to remove the minimum number of edges. Uh, okay. Uh, so we had one random rise suggestion, but uh, for computing minimum cut, although I'm not, I, I'm not confident it'll work. Um, that said, using just uh, your undergraduate algorithms background, uh, how might you solve the minimum cut problem? So I'm not trying to do anything randomized. Yeah. Okay, we can use max flow, and how in particular? Okay, yeah, so we can try S and T and try to find the minimum ST cut. And in principle, the, the minimum, I mean, the minimum cut must separate some pair. So if we can get just the right S and T, we'll be good. So, okay, fine. So for every pair S and T, uh, we'll run max flow min cut. We'll get the minimum st cut. Right? Okay. Uh, so if you choose, I guess, the wrong pair, you won't get a particularly interesting cut. But hopefully, eventually, you'll get the right pair. 
you'll get a good cut. Okay, great. So, uh, okay, so if you do this, uh, this is going to take, you know, n choose 2 times the running time for max flow. Within this general framework, can anyone suggest how to do a little bit better than n choose 2 times max flows? So right now, n choose 2 is from trying all pairs. Can you get that down to something more like n? Yeah. Yeah, especially since, yeah, so we just fix s, and it will try all the different t's, right? So s, whatever you pick, is on some side of the minimum cut. And now you just have to get a vertex on the other side. Okay? All right, simple enough. Just silly stuff. We'll all warm up. Okay. All right. Okay. So let me ask you guys sort of a, an odd question before we launch into the algorithmic, the new algorithm. So uh, this seems like maybe a kind of, the kind of question a graph theorist or a combinatorial uh, mathematician might think about. In general... What is the maximum number of minimum cuts that can be in a graph as a function of the number of vertices? Okay, what is the, kind of the best upper bound we can come up with in the worst case? So something that should hold for all graphs. Okay, so for example, maybe there's always a con at most a constant number of minimum cuts. Or maybe there's at most the polynomial number of minimum cuts. Uh, you know, exponential is a clear upper bound since there's only two to the n subsets that can form one side of the cut. Maybe something funky in the middle is like a sub-exponential running time, n to the log n, or no, count, n to the log n or something. Okay. All right, so those are maybe four categories, and I'm going to take a vote. Okay, so you have to choose one of the four, or you can vote for not voting. Okay, so you have five options. Okay, so who, who is not voting? Okay. Who thinks there's always at most a constant number of minimum cuts? You do have to vote now. Okay. Who thinks there will be at most a polynomial number of minimum cuts? Okay, I would say that's like 50%. Who thinks that maybe more than a polynomial but less than exponential, some funky sub-exponential count? Okay, two people. And who thinks uh, there would be there could be an exponential number? So we can come up with graphs where you really have to have try all subsets. Okay. 25%-ish, okay, all right, so somewhere down here, we have our last category of liars. <laughs> Minus two, okay, all right, okay, so, um, okay, fine, well, we'll be able to answer this question uh, soon enough. Okay, so here's here's the algorithm we're going to look at. It's sort of a uh, an odd algorithm. Okay, so so the algorithm we'll study we'll take start with some graph, and we're going to repeatedly and I'll have some pictures to kind of walk us through this in a moment. We're going to repeatedly pick one of the edges, and then we're going to like kind of contract the two nodes uh, between that edge. So we we keep shrinking edges, and that reduces the number of vertices in the graph until there's only two vertices left, and that kind of corresponds to connected components in the original graph, and that's the cut we return. Okay. An equivalent version, okay, would be, at least for unweighted graphs, you have to make some adjustments if it's weighted, is we're gonna assign a random number, say between zero and one, to every edge, okay? Then we'll build the minimum spanning tree, like in greedy order. So we'll keep adding the smallest weight edge. Okay. Now, uh, as you build the spanning tree, imagine, you know, the last edge will connect everything. 
So right before the last edge, you have two connected components. And that's what we'll output as the cut. Okay, so if you think about it, it's actually kind of doing the same thing. Because you're sort of adding edges in random order to the spanning tree and building out the connected components in random order. Okay, so adding to the spanning tree corresponds to contracting the edge. Okay. So I thought we could simulate this. If anyone has their laptop out, apparently half of you, can pull out a, a random number generator somewhere on the internet. Okay. And I don't know, numbers between one and a hundred. We'll assign edges, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put numbers on all the edges and see if we indeed can get the minimum cut of this graph. So obviously the minimum cut is just this middle edge, right? So this is sort of the easiest possible thing. Uh, so it's a little bit contrived, but still it's fun. Okay, anyone find a nice number generator with a good seed? Usually there's someone. All right, ready? Okay, so what we'll do is uh, we'll label all the edges on the left side first, and then all the edges on the right side second, and I'll go from top to bottom in each, and then we'll do the middle edge last because it's more dramatic that way. Okay, all right, so uh, I'll start with this top edge. 75. Okay, so yeah, 69, okay. Don't laugh. Okay, how about this one? Huh? 40. Uh, okay, that's ambiguous. Uh, sorry, let me... Sorry. 40, and then what? 99. Okay. Uh, 73. Okay. 78. Okay. 8. Finally, a small number. Okay. 51. 87. Is this really? Okay. <laughs> this is going to be tough. 33? Okay. Uh, okay. 75? 25. 25? 86? Uh, 88? Uh, four, uh, what's the other? 41, 8, 5, 78, what? 38. Okay. 94. Okay, now wait, just 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 wait. Uh, okay, so what does the middle edge need to be for us to actually get the minimum cut based on these numbers? So I guess we can build out the, the MST based on these numbers. So the five is in there, that small number. Eight is in there. I'm just doing the greedy algorithm. Uh, I guess 33 is in there, 25 is in there, the, tell me also if I make a mistake, I guess 38 is in there, 25 is not in there? Oh, that's fine, um, I guess the 40 edge I think is in there? Uh, 51? No, or, uh, 40 is in there. Uh, your guys' favorite edge. Okay. Uh, is that it? Okay, so what number do we have to beat? I think we have to beat 69, is that true? Okay. All right, so if the last number is less than 69, we'll actually get the minimum cut. If it's bigger, then we won't. 
Okay. Right, what does what is the last number? Eleven. Okay, great. All right. So I don't. Okay, good. All right. So uh, wait. Oh, so we didn't get it. Oh, bummer. Okay. So it didn't work. But you can at least probably see why the experiment is somewhat biased towards the middle edge. Right? Because uh, all these extra edges on this side connecting up this graph and adding a lot of connectivity over here is just uh, kind of increasing that or lowering that threshold uh, for uh, how, how big the last edge should be. Okay? All right. That's the first time it didn't work. Uh, but I guess... That was due to happen. Okay. All right. At least you guys understand the algorithm now. Okay. Fine. Okay. So that's the algorithm. Uh, if you were doing a weighted graph, none of my pictures are weighted because then it would be messy. You would, instead of uh, sampling an edge uniformly at random to contract, you would sample in proportion to the weight and contract that edge. That's completely equivalent to, at least if it was integer weights, if it had weight 10, just making 10 copies of the same edge and then applying the unweighted algorithm. All right, so just to make sure we're clear, um, when we quote unquote contract an edge after sampling in the in the contraction version, we did the spanning tree version together. But uh, I mean, I'm going to you know take u and v, combine them together, and then uh, you know some of the edges kind of collapse, so that edge was weight three is coming from one edge of weight two and the other edge of weight one. Okay, uh, and of course that's not so hard to do and uh, you know, rename some vertices and you have another graph. No big deal. Okay. Um, okay. So that also means that in the recursive calls, even if you're starting with an unweighted graph, the recursive calls are sort of working on the weighted graph, um, unless you want to think of those collapsed edges as parallel copies. That's fine, too. Okay, so, right. So I guess I, I, I drew some, some pictures of what might happen. Uh, so maybe we start from that dumbbell graph like this. We sample the bottom edge. So I've, I've put in purple the sampled edges. Uh, and if you pinch that purple edge together, then we get the three twos on the bottom. Then I guess we sample an edge in the top right. That squeezes together. And now you have some weight two edges because those become parallel. And so forth. I sample the top left. Now I have something looking like this. Okay, and one thing uh, we're at least noticing is is that the minimum cut remains the minimum cut as long as we don't sample it. All right, so that that's going to be very useful for us. Um, and so as you keep contracting, the graph keeps getting smaller and smaller. Um, here, I guess we're sampling this edge of weight four. Now you have something like that, and and so forth. Okay, so that. That is the, the contraction version of the algorithm, which is equivalent to the spanning tree version we did together. Okay. Fine. Fine. All right, so let's analyze. Uh, I think we all agreed, first of all, this is a ridiculous algorithm in some sense. Okay, so it's going to be fun to try to show to what extent it works. Okay, so... Here's how we're going to analyze it. I'm going to fix a particular minimum cut in the graph. I guess I'm calling a C star here. And uh, the question we want to answer is, what is the probability we output it? Okay. I'll note that uh, the running time itself of this experiment is uh, basically linear time if you do it correctly. It's not so hard to sample and squeeze an edge and keep on going. Okay. So what I'm really interested in is what are the odds that this thing even works. Otherwise, it's pretty fast. Okay. All right, so uh, the first observation we've already made, if you contract an edge that's not in the minimum cut, the minimum cut is still a minimum cut. Okay? Because really what contracting an edge do is sort of a, takes out of contention many some of the cuts, right? Once an edge is contracted, that's like, oh, they can never be separated, those vertices anymore. 
so just reducing the number of available cuts, every cut in the every cut in this contracted graph, I could kind of uncontract all the vertices and obtain a cut in the original graph. Okay, so a minimum cut down up there will still be a minimum cut down here, as long as I avoid sampling from the cut. Okay, so so. So we're going to output the minimum cut as long as we never sample from the minimum cuts. My goal is to get all the way down to two vertices without hitting the minimum cut. And uh, so that's really how we're framing the analysis. Okay. I'm going to let lambda denote the value of the minimum cut. Okay. All right. Okay. Here's our first lemma. It says that, so I'm summing over all the edges, the capacity of the edge, like the weight of the edge, right? It's flows and cuts, so I did capacities. It's saying that the total weight of all the edges is at least lambda times n over two. That, that's very good for us, right? Because I want to make sure I don't sample from the minimum cut. So it's saying that Lambda represents only like a 1 over n fraction of all the edges out there by weight, or 2 over n. Okay, so that's great, but we have to prove it. And you guys may be able to guess why. It's actually implicit in some comments made by you guys earlier. So the question is, why is the weight of the minimum cut at most a 2 over n fraction of the weight of all the edges. Why is it really small? Ah, so one comment from earlier is that, uh, you know, all the degrees represent weights of cuts, right? So we know that the minimum cut is at most the weight of the degree of any particular node. Okay. Uh, fine. So, uh, okay, so what do I have? I have n times lambda is less than equal to summing over all the vertices. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll write... Uh, the weighted degree of V. Okay, so that's what you guys just said, right? Okay. So you're only one step away now. What is the sum of degrees equal to? The double all the ed edge weights, right? So if I count up all the degrees, I'm counting all the edges twice. One at each endpoint. Once at each endpoint. So, this is also the case for a click. Well, we proved it for general graphs, right? So, just for the extreme. Uh, yes, I guess it'll be equal. It will, it'll be equal if, if, the, if the degrees themselves are the minimum cuts. So I guess that's also true of a cycle. Um, okay. Okay, so I, this is actually a very simple observation in some ways, right? We're just counting and saying, oh, the minimum cut is at most the weight of a, a vertex degree. No big deal. But it's very strong because it's saying that there's roughly only like a one in n chance that we sample the minimum cut if I choose an edge uniformly at random. That, that gives us a lot of hope. Okay, so, okay, so uh, if we know this, then, then as I said, the claim is that the, the probability that we sample a particular edge in, in a fixed iteration is at most 2 over n. Yeah? Uh, oh, the v is all the vertices. And then uh, lowercase v, which looks a lot like uppercase v, is one particular vertex. But smaller. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. So. Okay. I guess we already said this out loud, so I won't uh, belabor it. 
uh, okay, so the probability that in a, in a particular iteration, let's say there's n nodes left. Of course, there's n nodes initially, but later n might be a smaller number, right? Uh, and we're sampling in proportion to weight. Okay, so it's the weight of the minimum cut divided by the weight of all the edges in the graph. which we just showed is at most 2 over n. Okay? So, uh, in fact, the, the odds of hitting the, the minimum cut in the first iteration is pretty low. Like, you're probably not going to hit the minimum cut if n is very big. It gets a little trickier when you start getting down to 5 or 4 or 3 vertices, then the odds aren't so great. But in the, the big regime, uh, you're doing pretty well. So, so, so we've sort of established that on a per iteration basis, things are in our favor. But of course, uh, to actually get the minimum cut, you have to go on a winning streak, right? If you hit the minimum cut once, you're done. So that's our next challenge. Okay. All right. So here then is the claim. The odds that we do actually get the minimum cut and avoid sampling the minimum cut all the way through is uh, roughly one over, or is, is at least one over n choose two or roughly one over n squared or so. Okay, so that's the claim that roughly we have a quadratic one over n squared chance of returning the minimum cut. Okay, all right. So I guess I've already set up some notation. We're letting E sub K denote the event that the minimum cut hasn't been sampled after k iterations. Okay, so E sub 0 is, always happens because you don't hit the minimum cut at first. E sub 1 means the first iteration you survived. E sub 2 means you survived the first two iterations together, and so forth. Okay? And so what I want to show is that after I contract n minus 2 and there's only two vertices left, uh, the odds of surviving is... 2 over and choose 2. Okay, I, I think that should be a 1, but again, what's 2 between friends? Uh, all right. Let's hope that's correct, but we'll figure it out as we go along. Okay, so yeah, does, the, does the claim make sense and the notation make sense? Okay. All right, so. Okay, so let me, let me first suggest at a high level What's going on? I want to analyze kind of what are the odds of surviving at the end of a sequence of events, okay? And we've sort of shown how to survive one round at a time, or we've analyzed one round at a time, okay? So how can I somehow get, get at E sub n minus 2 via kind of these intermediate steps? Yeah. Uh, we won't have to, we won't actually have to do anything that fancy, but uh, but uh, well, actually, law of there's no expectations here, just probabilities. So all right, so we're going to try to un kind of unroll this using conditional probabilities. So. E sub n minus 2 is equal to, well, given that you survived the one round before times the probability you survive. Okay, so what is this saying? The probability I survived to the last or survived through the last round is a equal to the probability that I first survive all the way up to the, whatever, the round before the last or something, and then I survive one more round, okay? And of course, why end there? Right? And I keep going back one more round, one more round, one more round. Because at some level, our previous discussion was about analyzing this. Conditional on surviving however many rounds, what are the odds of surviving one more round? 
Okay. So if we unroll that all the way through, so we would have gotten something like, okay, so you have to survive the first round, then you have to survive the second round after surviving the first one. Something like this. Okay. All right. Uh, what is probability of E1? So what is the odds of surviving the first round, an upper bound? Uh, uh, we actually showed, we actually analyzed not E1 before, the probability of losing in the first round. So 2 over N is the odds of losing. So the odds of surviving is actually 1 minus 2 over N. Okay, so that's the first round because there's n vertices left. What's, what would the second round be like? What's E sub 2 given E sub 1? Yeah. Okay, 2 over n minus 1. And then this would be then, the new denominator, denominator would be n minus 2. Uh, and then this would, I think, be 1 minus 2 over 3. Hope I'm right. Okay, all the way through. Okay. All right, it looks complicated, but remember, each of those little events were, again, the very simple observation that the minimum cut is smaller than the degree. Okay. All right, so if I kind of write this out, I would get like n minus 2 times n minus 1. Nope, that's wrong times n minus 3, times n minus 4, all the way down to 1. In the denominator, I would get n times n minus 1, times n minus 2, all the way down to 3. Okay. So what does that look like? I guess the fancy way is to write, oh, that looks like n factorial, except you're dividing by, you got rid of the last 2. And up here, we have n minus 2 factorial. Okay. Which is 1 over n choose 2. So it turns out the math also works out very cleanly, uh, notationally. We don't. Those are vertices. N is vertices. So it's how many vertices are left. And when there's two vertices left, that's when the graph algorithm's done. So it's how many, uh, uh, how many edges we've contracted. The point is that the number of kind of vertices left in the graph is going down by one each time. Uh, we all, uh, you know, the key claim starts here, that lambda is at most an, a 1 over n fraction of the weight of the edges in the graph. That has nothing to do with the number of edges in lambda. Okay. Other questions? Something magical has happened. Okay. Great. All right. So let's go back to this question. Uh, half of you said polynomial, 25, don't, two people said sub-exponential, 25% said exponential, and the remaining are all dead to me. So we have shown that a particular minimum cut will return what's probability 1 over n choose 2. Now I'm suggesting that that actually implies a solution to this question. But what's the solution and what is the reason? Okay, so it's at most n squared. Why is it at most n squared? Okay, so it'll be tight for a cycle, but talking about a cycle won't tell us about general graphs. Uh, actually, if you add more edges into the cycle, the number of minimum cuts will decrease. That's um, obvious. When, and additionally, when, it, when you fully connect the graph, it actually becomes a completed graph, and the number of um, minimum cuts also increases. 
So what if you have a graph that doesn't contain a Hamiltonian cycle? That would be true. Okay, fine. All right. So, but but n squared is a good idea. But why? Why have we shown that there's at most n squared or so minimum cuts? Yeah. Yeah, so e however many minimum cuts there are, each of them has a 1 over n choose 2 chance at least of being returned by this algorithm. And the algorithm only returns one cut, right? So you can't have more than n choose 2 minimum cuts or else those probabilities would add up to more than 1. Okay, so somehow we've, we've been able to prove this uh, thing that, that seems very hard to prove directly by trying to construct graphs or some crazy thing. Right? Okay. And the cycle graph shows it's basically tight. If you have a cycle, then choosing any two edges will get you a minimum cut. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's cool. Great. Okay, so... Okay, so... Uh, this will take roughly a OM time if you're clever about which data structures you use to maintain your contraction. No big deal. Uh, but you only succeed with probability 1 over n squared. Okay, so if something only uh, succeeds with probability 1 in 10, you need to do it 10 times just to get that up to a, like a constant. Okay, so if you do n squared times, you have a constant chance of this thing working. Uh, question. question. Yeah. Um, well, uh, okay, so let me know if I'm answering your question correctly, but given the graph, I can first run BFS or DFS just to double check it's a connected graph. And uh, over the course of the algorithm, as I contract edges, I won't disconnect anything. I'll just be squeezing things together. So it'll always be a connected graph. Does that answer your question? I might have misunderstood. Well, you just run BFS once at the beginning. And then you, you know for, and that's just M time. Uh, and then you know that forever it'll always be connected. Besides, even if some disconnection did show up or something, all we care about is what happens at the end. And if it survives at the end, then it survives at the end. I guess we wouldn't even notice. The algorithm would continue on. Uh, well, you want to use a disjoint union and stuff. I don't know. Maybe it's M log N. It's definitely easy to do, but uh, okay, it doesn't matter. All right. The real point, though, is that is that the main issue, though, as far as our running time goes, we're not worried about logs at this point. Is that because the probability of the error probability is like one over n squared? I need to run it like at least n squared times just to get it to a constant, and after that, I can run it log n more times to get polynomially small error. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, we get roughly a running time of m n squared. I might have lied about the logs, but what's a log between friends? Um, but we're looking at something like m n squared. But that's actually not bad. Uh, and we made friends along the way. Okay. So the question is, uh, can we do better? Can I do faster than mn squared? That's what we'll talk about for the remaining of the lecture. Okay. All right. Uh, but we're going to roughly stick with the same algorithm, but we're going to make some adjustments internally. Does anyone happen to have any kind of off-the-wall ideas? So currently the algorithm just, at some level, contracts everything and it starts over. Contracts everything, starts over. Contracts everything when we repeat n squared time. And I want to do something smarter than starting over n squared times. Yeah. Yeah, so that's very good intuition. So we, we 
if you look at our analysis, the beginning is like easy peasy. The first, we're never going to lose in the first or second or third iteration. It only gets dangerous down below. Okay? So, uh, what we're kind of doing is doing the easy part and then doing the hard part and starting over, doing the easy part and then doing the hard part. Right? Easy. How, how might, uh, yeah, how might I leverage this to save some work? Yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe I have a graph and I try two different contractions, I split and I split and I split. The only one issue though is if you do it every iteration, it's going to blow up real quick. Oh, you sample two edges, and then you only keep the heavier edge. Oh, okay. Well, well one issue, though, if, if the minimum cut is just one big heavy edge or something, as opposed to many small edges, uh, that, yeah, so that will create some issue. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So maybe maybe if we feel really good about, I don't know, getting halfway through the graph, then we just let just maybe only restart this part or something like that. So the analogy I think of as... I don't know if this is dating myself. Are you guys old enough to play Pokemon once upon a time? <laughs> I'm not sure. But you know, you, you at some point you get to the boss or whatever, right? And then what do you do when you reach this stage? Ah, you save. You save, so if you lose, you can turn off the Game Boy, yell, and start over, right? Okay. All right, so, okay, right? That's what we do. Whenever we don't know what's about to happen, we save. Okay, so that we can do better next time. All right, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, uh, instead of restarting at the beginning, we're going to restart partway through. And we'll, we'll be careful about what partway is appropriate based on kind of how the numbers work out. And then not only that, but we'll, we'll do it recursively. Actually, let me be more specific. We're going to go partway through until I feel like the odds of succeeding is roughly one half up to this point. Because if I went all the way, it would be like 1 over n squared. So 1 half is still pretty healthy. And then we're actually going to use uh, an idea sort of suggested here, okay? Which was, at this point, uh, I'm actually going to make two copies of the graph, so to speak. Okay? And I'm going to now continue up here and continue down here and hope that one of those two are good. Okay? And then we're going to do everything recursively, of course. So for this copy... I'll roughly run until I feel like the odds are roughly one half of screwing up. Press save, make two copies, and recurse and recurse. So we will run it for a little while uh, so that we don't kind of branch out too much because obviously that creates work all the time. And then somehow we're going to guide this thing and make it work. So, uh, okay, so the high-level algorithm. Uh, okay, it's just what I said. I don't know why I erased it. Okay, all right, so I'm going to contract until... The odds of uh, kind of comes out to one half when if I multiplied all those things together. Then I'll make two copies of the current graph, and I'm going to recurse on both. Okay, and so in the recursions, there will also be some part way stopping and copying. Uh, okay, so you know you might start uh, with a graph like this, run it for a while, and then. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's some intermediate state. Okay, and this is roughly when I pause the Game Boy and I press save. Okay, and then the idea is uh, I'll, I'll run one version over here and one version over here. So maybe the version over here looks like uh, it's supposed to be here somewhere. Oh, okay, so maybe that version goes like that. Okay, and I run it over here with another save copy. And it's looking like that. So both of them are preserving the minimum cut. And then this also will fork off into two. Run it for a while. Maybe one of them doesn't get the minimum cut. That one doesn't get the minimum cut. This forks off into two. Didn't get the minimum cut. And uh, I erased it. Okay, I got the minimum cut. All right, whatever. But you guys get the idea, right? So I'm kind of forking and running. Okay, good. Okay, so that's 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 what we're going to analyze. Um, instead of restarting at uh, 
at the beginning. We're going to restart sort of path partway through, so to speak, but we're also going to do this branching. Okay, that's where this, this Galton-Watson process is going to come in. Uh, okay. So I guess uh, just to be a little bit more concrete, here would be some, some pseudocode. I guess the real, the real thing is that uh, I've already worked out some of the numbers. So we're going to run it until there's n over square root 2 vertices remaining. So if you start with n, until there's n over square root 2 remaining, and that's when we, when we, when we press save. Uh, right, so so here I'm imagining every time you contract e, e, you update G and C or something. Uh, but here, when I'm giving G C to this recursive call, I'm kind of giving it a copy, and it's not going to change from the scope of this call. Okay, the algorithm roughly makes sense. Okay. Okay, so uh, the claim is that if you do it this way, your odds of success go from 1 over n squared to 1 over log n or so. Okay, so a big improvement. Now, there is a, some downside, which is that our algorithm is slower because it's forking and it's doing some stuff, and we also have to work harder to bound the running time because, it's, yeah, we'll have to do some recursion trees. So it's not a free win, but in on balance, it'll come out in our favor at the end. Okay, so we want to prove that this thing succeeds with at least one over log n fraction of the time. Okay, okay. and uh, to, to analyze this, this branching process, uh, we're going to relate it to uh, something called uh, the Galton-Watson process, which was studied, I think they're actually biologists, population biologists. So they, they imagine things like, oh, you have a species that I guess you just have one, and they have two offsprings, but they have one half chance of survival, okay? And then you have an, one of these offsprings, they have two offsprings, but each only have a one half chance of survival. And then you know, after 100 rounds, what are the odds that the population has died out or it's still alive? And they might say, oh, what if it's a little more than one half? What if it's a little less than one half? And they kind of study these, these things, okay? Uh, so we're looking at a particular special case, partly because we get to make the algorithm so I can choose one that's nice for our calculations. So uh, the way I'm going to frame it is, okay, let's say you have a binary tree of height k. Okay, so roughly 2 to the k nodes or something like that. Uh, and suppose I delete every edge with probability at most one half. So these green squigglies are supposed to denote the deleted edges. And I'm interested in what are the odds that there's a path from a root to the leaf? So that's sort of like the population surviving after k generations. Someone in the population surviving. Okay. So the claim, which we're going to first treat as a fact, and then time permitting, we'll, we'll fully analyze at the end. The claim is that the odds of getting some path from the root to the leaf, so nothing gets deleted along the way, is, is proportional to the height of the tree. Okay, so full tree, every edge gets dropped with probability one half, and then the odds of, of being able to get to some leaf at the end is proportional to the height. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's uh, now let's analyze this algorithm assuming this, this fact about binary trees and deleting edges is true. And, and sh at least show why it's kind of interesting. Okay? Does anyone want to take a stab at how we're going to relate the algorithm to the tree? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we're going to sort of think of the recursion tree of all those sub-problems. And, and, you know, what are the odds of kind of not hitting the minimum cut, not hitting the minimum cut, not hitting the minimum cut on one of these paths? I just need one of these branching things to succeed. Okay, so, okay, so we're going to model those recursive calls as a tree. Uh, good, I did. Each node will represent a sub-problem, okay? And then, 
And I guess the edges are the, you know, from one sub problem to a sub sub problem, right? Okay. All right. So now what does it mean for an edge to be deleted? Okay. So if I'm at a particular kind of sub problem, I'll delete the parent edge. If, um, if, okay. So when we do the branching, we contract edges for a while and then we split. So I'm only going to delete the parent edge. If in that initial part, I, I hit the minimum cut. Otherwise, if, it, if the mistake happens later, that'll show up later in the tree. Okay, so I'm going to delete the parent edge of a node or subproblem uh, uh, if, if it fails when contracting before those recursive calls. Okay, um, good, and uh, right, right, great. Okay, so, so now kind of the, the remaining question then is, is to try to analyze what is the probability of an edge being deleted, and in particular, we want to show it's at most one half. Okay. All right, so. All right, so, okay, so all we have to really do is generalize what we've already done. We, we previously went from n down to 2. Now we just want to go from n to uh, k or some k and then figure out what's the right k to make sure things are at least one half. Okay, so, uh, you know, we would set up everything the exact same way. Uh, hopefully that's correct, something like that. Uh, and then, uh, just like before, we would get something like, oh, 1 minus 2 over n, 1 minus 2 over n minus 1, uh, all the way down to 1 minus 2 over n minus k. No, no, that's not right. It should be n minus n minus k minus 1. So it should be like k plus 1, hopefully. If I did that right. Uh, okay, fine. So uh, if we write all that out, uh, we get like n minus 2 times uh, n minus 3 times all the way down to uh, k minus 1, I think. Just correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, n times n minus 1 all the way down to k plus 1. Hopefully that's correct. Um, fine. Uh, so you get like n factorial over k factorial over here, n minus 2 factorial over k minus 2 factorial. Okay, so it's like k times k minus 1 over n times n minus 2. Okay, great. So roughly, I, I just want to say, okay, how, how, how small can I make k so that that number is barely bigger than 1 half? I want my odds of surviving to be at least 1 half. And it's roughly n over square root 2 because you have n over square root 2 times, yeah. Yeah, it should. Shouldn't it? Great. All right. Who's checking? All right. Um, the homeworks will be graded more carefully than the lectures. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So just believe me, if you did n over square root 2 plus 1 and you push it through, you'll get at least one half. Okay. Fine. Okay, so, so what have we shown? Uh, that, okay, so that was already sort of encoded in the algorithm. It was, it was always n over square root 2 plus 1. Uh, and uh, we have shown uh, that the odds now of kind of deleting a parent edge is at most 1 half. <coughs> like we wanted to be able to use our theorem. Okay. All right. Um, good. Now, what is the height of our tree, our recursive tree? 
What is the height of this algorithm up to constants? Log n, why? It's decreasing by constant factor. It's always going down by roughly square root 2. So the height is log n. Okay, great. Okay. Now if we use that fact, if you can see it in the top right corner, it seems like it's obscured a little bit. Uh, but if we use our fact, now what are the odds of actually succeeding all the way through? Yeah. One over what? Well, okay, that there's a there's a gazillion paths. There's like two to the k paths, right? One, two, three, yeah. Yeah. One over the height, which is uh one over log n. Okay. Okay, so that, that gets us our probability of succeeding. Good. Okay, so so this version of the algorithm will will return the minimum cup more often than our original version. I guess that's not too surprising because it's more conservative because it's saving and restarting and forking and stuff like that. So this is only compelling if the running time comes out better. So let's figure that out. Okay, so here then is uh, uh, the recursion. So I make two subproblems of roughly size n over square root 2. And uh, I spend time roughly proportional to the number of edges, which originally is m in the original graph, but once you get small, in the worst case, it's a dense graph. So if you have n vertices remaining, there's at least at most n squared edges. Okay, at most n squared. Okay, so two subproblems of size n over square root 2 plus, say, n squared work to get to that point. Okay, n squared just being an upper bound on the number of edges. All right, how do we analyze this? If you say Mather's theorem, I'll kick you out. <laughs> okay, we're going to make a recursion tree. Okay, so I start with a subproblem of size n. I get two subproblems of size n over square root two. You get four subproblems of size n over four. Right. Uh, what? Oh, yeah, that's how it works. Okay. Good call. And so forth. So uh, at the top level, the total work is like n squared. Right? At the second level, the total work is... Two times n over square root two squared, which is n squared. At the third level, the total work is four times n over two squared, which is n squared. In general, we have uh, you know two to the i problems, each of size n over two to the i over two because it's just doing square root twos. Square, oh, squared. Okay, which comes out to, sometimes I ask a question that's so boring that no one wants to answer. Okay, that will come out to n squared, right? Okay, so every level is n squared. And then what is the height? Log n. Log n. Okay. We get n squared log n time. Okay, and it succeeds with probability 1 over log n. Okay, so maybe I have to run it log n times to get it up to constant probability. And now I have an n squared log square n running time. Before we had m times n squared. So we've removed the factor of m. Okay. Uh, and and all, the only trick we introduced was we didn't really do anything new from a graph algorithm's point of view. We just were more clever about amplifying and, and, and saving our progress. It was all from the, the probabilistic side. All right. Okay, so that's that. 
Okay, so all that remains is is to to prove this, and this is maybe yeah. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Okay, so if I was more careful, all right. So let me let me just uh, do this. Okay, so high probability is just one over poly n for any polynomial you want, and usually it doesn't matter which polynomial. If you wanted to do n to the fourth or n to the fifth, it only changes things by constant in any situation I can think of. Now, in our case, it takes us n squared log n time, and we succeed. So let me do this slowly. With probability one over log n. Okay. Now, if I if I repeated uh, some k times for some parameter k will determine. Okay. The odds of them all failing. Okay. Would immediately be at most one minus one over log n to the k. Okay. That's the odds of them all failing. Okay. Of course, that's a mess to look at. So how do I make this easy? you're to work with. What's my next step mathematically? We've done this once before. Hmm? Yeah, okay. So 1 plus x is less than equal to e to the x for all x. This is the most important thing in this class, including linear expectation. Okay, e to the minus k over log n. So those are your odds of failing, right? And all that's happened is that mathematically this is more convenient because the k is right next to the log n. So now I know how to choose k however I want. So if I wanted this term to be at most uh, 1 over n squared, what should I make k? I want this to be at most 1 over n squared. So what should k be? e to the negative 2 over log n. That's not 1 over n squared. I mean, that's, that's, that's very close to 1, I think. It goes to 1 as n gets big. Uh, 2 log n squared. So if I did 2 log n squared over log n, then I get I can use one log to cancel out the denominator, and then I have one log left. I guess I should have used natural log instead of log, but that's okay. And then you get your one over n squared. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Okay, so well, what this does what this does tell you is that once you get the probability of error down to a constant or down to one over log n, uh, you can start ramping things up pretty quickly. And you usually only have to pay logarithmic factors to get polynomially small error. Okay. All right. So let's do this as much as we can. Uh, this particular fact. This is an important fact for us. Uh, so again, uh, so it's, the setup is that you have a binary tree, complete tree of height k, Delete every edge with probability of most one half. You know, what are the odds that we can get to the root? For us, that represented where the odds the algorithm succeeds. Okay. All right. So this is one is maybe less fun. This is more uh, more technical. Okay. Um, so so how we're going to set it up is that for each level i, so level zero is the root, level one is one level below, and so forth. Uh, let's say that p sub i, uh, oh, no, no, uh, oh, how did I do this? Maybe p sub 0 is supposed to be the, the floor. Okay, so p sub 0 actually is, is, is the least, okay? So level is counting from bottom to top, okay? So, uh, but p sub i is, okay, what are the odds of somebody at level 10? So there's 10 rows below, or 9 or something. What are the odds that one this particular node can get to the bottom? Okay, and ultimately we want to figure out like p sub k for a parameter k. Okay, so we'll start with p sub zero. So p sub zero is at the leaf level. Okay, so every leaf can of course reach a leaf. There's no edges left. So that's just one. Okay. Now let's set up a, a nice recurrence for p sub i plus one. So I'm imagining some node at level i plus one. Okay, 
which has two nodes uh, at level I, which, you know, goes down to the bottom and stuff, right? Okay, so, okay, so maybe one way to look at it is, okay, if I can't, so if this node at level I plus one cannot reach the bottom, so one minus piece of I plus one represents this, then uh, both the left child and the right child are in some way screwed up, right? Because neither of them could reach the bottom. Okay, so, okay, so if we just look at the left child, okay, uh, there's kind of two ways it could be screwed up. One is that this edge gets deleted, okay, or this node cannot reach the children, okay? So it was prob probability one half that parent edge got deleted and was remaining probability uh, that child, for whatever reason, couldn't reach the bottom. So I get one half P sub I, okay? And it has to happen to both sides and they have nothing to do with each other, so they just multiply, okay? So rearranging PI plus one is equal to uh, one minus one half plus one half PI squared, which, uh, forgive me, I want to skip one thing, happens to be equal to PI times one minus PI over four. If I'm wrong, you can correct me but then we might have to stay later, okay? All right, so, okay, that's fine. Okay, so, uh, whatever, we have some recurrence, okay? I wanna show the claim is that P sub K is at least one over K for all K, okay? So I've worked out the first two or three values. P zero is, of course, one. Uh, P one, if you just plug in, you get three fourth. P two, you plug in, you get something that's a little bit more than one half. If you look at it, okay. Now, uh, first of all, uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay. All right, so at some level, I know that, uh, uh, okay, so what do we know? I know that P sub K plus one is equal to uh, P sub K times one minus P sub K over four, okay? Uh, now by induction, I'm, I'm claiming that P sub K is at least one over K, but it's not obvious that kind of rounding up P sub K is, uh, is actually gonna go up, right? And I wanna upper bound like this, but at the moment it's not obvious that, that rounding up from P sub K to one over K will give you the inequality. So you have to just, uh, do a little bit of, if you look at the function in the recurrence, so that's f sub x is x times 1 minus x over 4, and you do the kind of thing where you look at the, the gradient, okay, what's f prime of x? Uh, that's 1 minus uh, x over 2. And then you look at the gradient, then you can see that f is increasing for x less than or equal to 2. So that justifies... Uh, indeed, being able to replace P sub K with 1 over K. 1 over K. 1 minus 1 over 4K. Uh, right? Okay. Uh, what comes next? Uh, okay. So this is equal to uh, 1 over K minus... 1 over 4 k squared. Okay, I want to show this is at most 1 over k plus 1, eventually. Uh, which you might believe, because 4 k squared is way smaller than, 1 over 4 k squared is way smaller than k. And uh, indeed, uh, knowing I would run out of time, I left some of these calculations on the bottom. The actual difference between 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1 is 1 over k squared plus 1. Hopefully, that's verifiable, which is much more than 1 over 4k squared. I rearranged some terms. Okay. So, indeed, 1 over k minus 1 over 4k squared is at, is at most 1 over k plus 1. 
Okay, just some arithmetic to pull it off. The hard part of this is just setting up the proof to begin with, and then the calculations are okay. And uh, and that's it. So so all put together, we got an algorithm. Uh, yeah, that that completes the lecture. So this is faster. Yeah. I mean, there are two 